This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast in which we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Josh Milburn and I do like Knowing Animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. You can join ASA today for only 60 Australian dollars if you're a waged academic. And there's also a concession rate of 15 Australian dollars. Membership comes with all kinds of benefits. For example, there was recently a call for applications to the Society's Activity Fund, providing members with the chance for some funding for research or creative projects. The episode is also brought to you by the Animal Public's book series from Sydney University Press. This is a collection of scholarly books focused on animal studies. At the time of recording, the release of Elizabeth Ellis's Australian Animal Law, Context and Critique is just around the corner. I know this will be a book of great interest to lots of regular listeners. This week's guest is Dr Natalie Evans. Natalie, who also publishes as Natalie Thomas, is an adjunct faculty member in philosophy at the University of Guelph in Canada. She's the author of 2016's Animal Ethics and the Autonomous Animal Self, published by Palgrave Macmillan, as well as the editor of Palgrave Macmillan's new collection, Animals and Business Ethics. Today we're going to talk about her chapter in that volume, which is entitled Gene Editing, Animal Disenhancement and Ethical Debates, A Conundrum for Business Ethics, and it was co-authored with Adam Langridge. We'll also talk a little bit more about the book more broadly. Welcome to the podcast, Natalie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So what led to you editing a book about animals and business ethics? Yes, so actually a few a few things led to this. Bob Fisher, who I'm sure you're familiar with, he actually put a call out for someone that would be interested in taking this on with Springer some years ago. And so I talked to him about it. And I think because of my own background, I've been teaching business ethics was actually the first course I ever taught. And so I've been teaching it for many years and I designed and written a lot of courses in business ethics. And I guess I realized that business ethics generally never (laughs) touches on animals, which seems really a really huge omission considering how much and how many businesses are related to animals. And I started to realize our economy is really based in large part on animals and their uses. So, so I contacted him and, and looked into it and then put in a proposal and had some people in mind even that would be good contributors to it. And, and that was that. There was definitely an an interest and a lot of people seemed interested in the topic. More so, I would say, from the animal ethics side than from the business ethics side of things. But it just made sense that this was an area that animal ethics hadn't really made a lot of impact in yet. Like there hadn't been a lot of crossover connections between the two fields. So it just made sense. I think it was long overdue that there was a volume dedicated right just to this even though there has been some work in more specific topics related to animals and business practices but nothing really like this i think it's very interesting that you draw this clear distinction between animal ethics and business ethics because i think a lot of our listeners will be very familiar with animal ethics we talk to animal ethicists quite a lot and i call myself an animal ethicist so how do you think that business ethics focusing on animals would or should differ from the Mm -hmm. kind of animal ethics we're more familiar with? I mean, typically in in business ethics, so if I'm, for example, teaching a course on business ethics, there are sort of these standard topics that you would look at. So just as in any kind of applied ethics field, you're going to look at sort of key ethical theories, you know, the classic utilitarian and deontological and those things. And then you look at some of the key issues that arise in business practices. So often you'll find like corporate responsibility and codes of ethics and stakeholder theory and things like that, that come up. But if you kind of look at the the research and the the publications, et cetera, on business ethics, animals just aren't 
generally included the only time they would really be included would be under kind of the the broader category of sustainability and business ethics so so that is whenever you get talk of environment you find this you know in other fields too you get sort of animals they get sort of pulled into or or added like it's some kind of appendix to <laughs> um, environmental ethics. So it's kind of the same way in business ethics. You have talk of sustainability and corporate social responsibility. And then animals sometimes get uh, get added or left out. And often they're just referred to more in terms of how the impacts of a business might affect the surrounding environment, including wild species usually of animals. So it is kind of surprising that so business ethics, I mean, if you think what would business ethics look more specifically at, it would look at things like, you know, how does how would corporate social responsibility include animals specifically? There's very little work done on that or animals and stakeholder theory like the, you know, the chapter in this book by Josh Smart is actually, you know, if you look around, it's pretty much the first dedicated piece of work on animals as stakeholders. So people sometimes talk about the humans in the field, like human workers in animal in related industries as stakeholders or as important for a corporation to consider their interests, but animals just generally are not included in that at all. So when you really start looking through the business ethics, like literature, there's just, a, a, again, like it, it focuses on these key issues related to business practices, but animals are generally just not included. So you do tend to get people from animal ethics looking at, right, you know, political socioeconomic structures and political structures from that kind of perspective, but not so much jumping into the field of business ethics and having contributions that, for example, might be accepted by like a business ethics journal or something like that. So do you think the kind of topics that are explored in the chapters here, do you think they're the sort of things that would fit in a business ethics journal? Yes and no. Uh, So kind of interesting, too, is that even through the reviewing process for the book, most of the people that reviewed, you could (laughs) you could actually tell the background of the reviewers. And I mean that not in a negative sense, but generally people from the business ethics side that were doing reviews were very much like, well, this isn't strong enough in the business ethics side. And the people from the animal side were like, I love this, right? (laughs) And and just really excited about about the topics. So So I do think actually that a lot of the topics maybe should be in business ethics, but I'm not sure. There's a lot of resistance to so a couple of things business ethics can sometimes tend to be a bit more pragmatic in terms of supporting business practices it's always the joke that business ethics is an oxymoron you know you have to get that out of the way when you teach a course in business ethics you're like first day yes i know it's an oxymoron (laughs) and then you move forward but there's just generally a lot of maybe resistance to talking about certain things within the field that are not you know this is business we got to focus on what's pragmatic to being profitable and being usable by businesses. So there is sort of this idea that certain ethical topics or issues are not in the realm of what businesses should be concerned about at all. And that's where I think there's a bit of some tension. So you might have some business ethics journals or or folks that are like, yes, we need to talk more about these issues, but you might also come up against a lot of resistance where it's like this strictly isn't business ethics. So I think that's where there might be some tension. But again, there's more work coming out in this area, but there's still very, very little. Let's take a look at your chapter. So it's a chapter about animal disenhancement. Yeah. So so the idea, you know, there was an article that came out actually many, many years ago. And it was funny. It was when I was in my PhD and my advisor said, hey, have you read this? And I can't think of the name right this second, but it was about something about blind chickens and dis- the, the ethical, you know, question of disenhancement. I remember reading it and thinking that's really interesting, but it's not likely to happen where you would take an animal, genetically modify it to disenhance, for example, its mental capacities or cognitive capacities, or, and then resulting in basically a lowered ability to suffer or to feel pain or something like that. So you're, you're basically, rather than enhancing a certain quality, you're removing it or taking it away or disenhancing, right, is the word that's used. The idea being that, of course, once we get into it, like this could be a way to reduce animal suffering and pain 
and increase potentially production and and just efficiency and productivity. The idea is that you could create a chicken that is almost blob-like in terms of you would disenhance it to the point where it couldn't feel pain. It wouldn't even necessarily participate in like what we would maybe think of as chicken behaviors or things like that so that you could, you wouldn't really have to worry about welfare concerns that might restrict your ability as a producer to produce mass amounts of meat, for example, or something like that. So that's kind of originally, I think, where they, the sort of thought came from. Like if we are getting better at genetically modifying animals and species, why don't we just disenhance them, right? Rather than just enhancing, like we want to create, you know, breed chickens to grow really large breasts, right? For more meat. Why not also disenhance their mental capacities? So I think one of the reasons that this debate about disenhancement can be quite frustrating, at least to me, is that there are a lot of different things thrown under the banner of disenhancement. Mm -hmm. So there's a big distinction, to use the examples you just used, between breeding a blind chicken and breeding a chicken that can't experience pain. But on top of that, in the chapter, you introduce the idea that some supposedly non-suffering animals may experience suffering, even if they don't behave like they're experiencing it. And then you also introduce the idea that some disenhanced animals may have preferences and interests that are thwarted despite the fact they don't suffer. So given all of this, and especially given what you were just saying about business ethics being focused on the practical and the pragmatic, Do you think the idea of disenhancement that could make animal farming completely suffering free is realistic? No, that's a really good question. At at the end of the day, I don't. So for one thing, we're still studying animal minds. We're still trying to figure out how animals think and perceive, and we're still debating like how to study animal minds in a way that's actually accurate to the way animals think. And that's very broad. And then you have specific species of animals with different kinds of capacities and and all those kinds of things. So my worry is that if we say, oh, well, we have, you know, effectively modified this creature so that it doesn't suffer anymore. First of all, what does that even mean? There's so many different ways to suffer that are also species specific. And we still have these questions about animal minds. So that was my worry that you might think you've eliminated suffering and you've created or inadvertently enhanced a different form of suffering you know and i think business ethics again in terms of its in this case with animals the goal clearly is increased productivity and efficiency right for creating animal products and if that's the goal then it's very easy to dismiss what i think are quite serious philosophical and philosophy of science and philosophy of mind questions that you can't just ignore. And that's why I thought this was a really interesting issue for showing the depth of the philosophical conundrum that is inextricable from the business ethics questions. And really that was part of my purpose for the chapter too, was not just looking at this issue of genetic disenhancement of animals, but also to really try to show that like you can't necessarily just easily separate or extract the business ethics questions from the deeper philosophical ones. So that was part of what I was hoping to show. But, and then the other part of the suffering I think is, is, and I mentioned in the chapter, like the humans that are working with these animals, I think we forget, right? And I think there's a lot of chapters in the book that, that I really loved because they really draw out the nature of the suffering and the trauma that can be experienced by human workers that are working with animals that are suffering. So I know we see a lot of humans that are, we see these videos come out that are horrific abuse of these animals. But I also tend to think there's something going on psychologically there that people would act, would act that way. I don't think that's naturally part of what most humans would do. So it worries me that if you had a disenhanced animal, that is going to like exacerbate the problem of the nature of this weird relationship between, you know, farmer or and farm worker and farm animal which already has these, you know, interesting and kind of sad contradictions between you love your animal, but you're also raising it to kill it. And knowing that, you know, it's not going to be necessarily killed in some happy, painless way. I don't know if it's different there, but like for here, you know, animals are not generally slaughtered on the farm. They're transported, which is huge suffering. So I think that it 
to me, if you had a disenhanced animal, it might make it even more psychologically confusing for a person working with that animal to know how to interact and relate to it. It's already very difficult, right? And there's already a lot of trauma built into those relationships. So I think this would make it worse. I think it would increase the suffering for farmers and farm workers as well, potentially as the animals. Let's go back to these questions about the links between the deep philosophical problems mm -hmm. and the business ethics question, because that's mm -hmm. where this chapter and indeed this book is, is unique. That's what this is offering to the conversation. What do you think that business ethics as a discipline or as a practice, perhaps, can add to questions about animal disenhancement? Yeah, that's a big question. And I think there's there's a few things to think about. And I think that my impression, and maybe I'm wrong, but my impression is that business ethics has given these frameworks and has developed these frameworks for thinking about stakeholder management and stake, the, the value of stakeholders. Corporate social responsibility, I think, is a very big one. And now these questions of sustainability in terms of relationship to the environment. I think the pandemic has brought these further forward. So we saw you know, a lot of the conditions workers of, you know, I know early on, like here in Canada, there was a lot of problems with COVID spreading like wildfire through meat processing plants and slaughterhouses and things like that. It's just as one example, but it, it brought forward the idea that there are these frameworks in business ethics that are quite valuable and really useful. And I think that if we could you know, bring this, like the philosophical knowledge and what we know about animals and from animal ethics and, and start moving more into bringing these together. I think we'd have more fruitful solutions that I don't think are a total, I think a lot of people think it's, it'll become a cop out. It'll be like, well, we'll just buy into the fact that we should keep animal, you know, keep farming animals and whatever. I don't think that's necessarily the case in all cases, because even like your chapter in the book with Kendra Coulter, looking at there are new animal friendly businesses and humane, not just in terms of the animals, but in terms of the workers. Right. And, and so I think business ethics can be a place where we can use those frameworks and then start to look at like we don't necessarily have to stay and do the same thing and keep doing the same industries over and over again. They can change and they are changing. So why don't we take what's already there in business ethics and then start adding in and molding together like these concerns from animal ethics and the philosophical issues. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we should, maybe we should call it something different. <laughs> maybe it's not just business ethics versus animal ethics. It's like something new, but I think they, there's a lot of really useful frameworks in business ethics like the stakeholder theory and animals like that we could really harness to say, here's some really good justification that I think then business ethics scholars and businesses could look at and say, that's helpful. Like that's really helpful for putting into practice. Again, like I don't think they necessarily have to grapple with the deep philosophical issues, but I think like some of the research that I found that I included in the chapter was like a meta analysis looking at like, you know, how many, animal related businesses actually included animals in their corporate social responsibility statements and it was less than half so like right there it would be really useful to have someone coming in and saying here's how you could think about right incorporating animals into your corporate social responsibility statements into your code of ethics and into your practices so i think there's a useful place just like there are for for bioethicists in many fields i think it could work to bring animal ethicists kind of in that way into the sort of realm of business ethics. I like this. So this idea of corporate social responsibility statements, mm -hmm. including animals within them, that's a simple practical step that businesses and business ethicists and other people engaged with businesses could take to make businesses a little more animal friendly. I mean, it's not going to yeah. save the world, but it's certainly going to help, hopefully. Yeah, it helps. I guess the other thing is about recognising animals as stakeholders in businesses. What does that mean to recognize an animal as a stakeholder? Yeah, that's a good question too. So there's different types of stakeholders, right? And you also have to, there's also different rankings. You have to be able to rank the, you know, the relevance, the salience, all that kind of stuff with your stakeholders. So 
So often, of course, what you have are almost like like an expanding circle from the business, right? Of your immediate and directly impacted kind of stakeholders, like your employees and your consumers and suppliers and things like that. And then you start moving out from that, right? So nature, for example, would be outside that or, or animal advocacy groups. So when you think about animals, then the question is, well, but they are directly impacted by obviously right by certain companies that use them so what would that look like i think we're in new territory to be honest like what would that look like and this is a bit of a challenge obviously because you know developing a new concept of what an animal stakeholder would be i think is necessary because you're going to have to look at very different interests so for example you know the health and welfare of your employees is one thing but generally speaking and I'm not trying to sound crass here, but you're not going to kill your employees after they've finished their job. Whereas with an animal, the killing of the animal, generally speaking, is always part of that. So how do you account for that? I think thinking about an animal as a stakeholder, and like I said, the chapter in the book, you know, looks at that it was one of the first looks at it, but it's difficult, right, to think because what does that mean? Well, you'd have to account for its interests, the ways in which the company impacts the animals themselves, and then the weight the relative weight of that stakeholder in your company. And and I think that's going to be a, a, a really difficult one because it would require if you, whoever's interest as a stakeholder, you take very seriously, it changes the way you do business. It has to, right? So, so that's where I think you would run perhaps into some of these challenges. Like, what does that mean? Well, it's going to have to change a lot for certain companies. For example, an intensive farm. I don't know that how it could really continue in its present form if you really counted an animal as a direct stakeholder. So, yeah, I think there'd have to be a lot of real thinking about that. And, you know, and you have companies like that aren't as directly. So I think of something like Lush, right? Where it's not actually farming these animals. It's not directly testing on them. So it's got a different relationship to animals as stakeholders. They would see stakeholders as further removed. Whereas a company that uses them as products, it's much different, right? So even the questions about like understanding the status of an animal. So one of the chapters right in the book looks at like animals as commodities. Are they commodities? That's a hugely important question, because if they're a commodity, they are not a stakeholder. You don't look at your products as stakeholders. So that is a huge issue, like a huge issue. And I think there's room for a lot more work in that area to kind of try to navigate, like, what would this look like? And it would be specific to different industries. It's striking to me then that this idea of animals as stakeholders ends up being quite radical. This couldn't be used as a kind of veneer to defend the status quo. This is going to be, no, we need to change how we relate to animals if we recognise them as stakeholders. I think so. So maybe corporate social responsibility is a first step. Yeah. And then stakeholder as a second step as there's something to aim towards in the future. Would that be a fair summary? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I think that, so for me, I, even in the chapter, I kind of make some recommendations. I'm like, you know, the first step really is on companies that use animals I mean, you can't hold a company as accountable unless they're transparent and they identify these are our values, like this goes into our code of ethics, you know, or this is the kind of company we want to be. These are our ideals and our visions and stuff like that. And then even, of course, getting a good a good corp statement of corporate social responsibility and code of ethics will get more into the nitty, nitty gritty of like, how do we actually do this? And even further to that, companies that take that seriously will report like they'll they will actually provide reports yearly reports on their corporate social responsibility how did we do did we actually meet these you know goals and 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 they are kind of doing this social accounting and and reporting so i do think it's valuable like i know a lot of people are like oh it doesn't mean anything companies still do whatever they want but at the same time it's a it's a place to try to hold some someone accountable and say look you can look at this company and say they really have thought about and tried to consider their views on animals given the impacts on animals that their practices have so i think it's step one to kind of do that. And I think also they, you know, another chapter talks about, you know, corporate disclosure as well. So I think there's, you know, some of that is touched on in the book, a company trying to get 
to clearly and transparently come out and say this is what we believe. So it could be it could be against the best interests of some companies to come out and state their views on animals and their values related to animals, depending on how they're using them. So that's probably why it's very lacking. But I just think the more, you know, as consumers as well and that's debatable the power we have as consumers but i still think there's power there and i think that as consumers we want to see like consumers increasingly seem to want to know like where is this coming from what's going on with this and they, there is power there's power in boycotting in you know things like that there is power in that where i've taught business ethics classes where we've looked at some of the PETA campaigns against mcdonald's like worked <laughs> they worked and they changed it wasn't about getting McDonald's to stop, you know, including animal products, but it was about, for example, like, where are you, like, are you supporting farms that are treating chickens in this way? There have been these different campaigns even that have been successful in changing companies. There's like a threshold where a company suddenly realizes, okay, now we need to, to address this issue because it's gained a certain amount of power and movement, usually on social media to the point where they're feeling it. And then they're like, okay, we got to address this. Now, Natalie, we ask every guest on Knowing Animals five quick questions. Yeah. Are you ready for your five quick questions? Yes. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Not specifically, but I would have to say it was most likely sort of the Regan and Singer combo, probably in my undergraduate degree in an environmental philosophy course. If I, if I really think about it, that's probably the first time I read those views. Yeah. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? No, but again, I think that I suspect and I seem to recall that I spent a lot of time responding to Singer and critiquing Singer because I didn't agree with them from the get-go. <laughs> if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? It would actually, I think, have to be Christine Korsgaard. When I first read, she had a Tanner lecture, which was sort of her first kind of, for me anyway, the first thing I read on her views on animals. It really captured me and it really pushed me to think much harder. I was already very interested in Kantian ethics. And when I read that, it was like, ooh, this really, and it really spurred my whole PhD thesis, my first book. It really spurred me into all of that. What do you think is the most important thing that academics can do for animals? That's a really good question, and it's not really a quick question. It's, um, <laughs> it's I'm of two minds. I think on the one hand, academics do this really important deep thinking about animals and the human-animal relationship, and and I think that's really important, and I think we need to protect it. I, I feel a little bit protective of philosophy and, you know, and certain subject in the arts that are sort of targeted for funding cuts and things like that, because I think we do really... And I'm not, you know, maybe I'm biased, but I really think there's, that's important and valuable work. I also think it's really important as academics to teach this. And the, and the reason I say that is because it's very rare that I have an opportunity to teach on animal ethics. And I just taught this semester a fourth year course, and it was actually in an arts and science program. And I taught on animal minds. So the question of how do we study animal minds? I didn't include animal ethics. And at the end of the semester in the reflections, course reflections, I would say almost half of the students wrote, I am seriously rethinking my relationship with animals and whether or not I can eat them anymore. And we didn't talk about the ethics. We didn't talk about not eating animals. We only focused on like, how, do, how should we study animal minds? And that really struck me that, that really it was knowledge of animals and how they think and how they behave and all that kind of stuff was enough to really make students naturally move to the ethical questions and that really was powerful so so i think that work i think teaching it and i think we forget i think we get oh because we talk to people that know about animal ethics and animal minds and we get used to our little groups of people that think the same and then when i teach i'm reminded that this is new for so many people so i think there's a huge value in that and another question that maybe isn't as quick as it could be. If you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human-animal relationship, what would it be? 
it's funny because I was, I was thinking about this and the first, the first word that comes into my head is compassion, which might not normally be what I would have gone with like a few years ago. I t- just tend to think that, and it doesn't sound maybe necessarily so animal ethics of me to say that, but I tend to think that regardless of your, you know, education, of your socioeconomic status, of any of those things, if you sort of just look at an animal with compassion, it just changes your relationship. I think that we lack a lot of compassion, generally speaking. So I think that, you know, you know, that's my wish. That would be like my ideal, like wave a magic wand and everyone would be compassionate towards animals. I think of all the hunters, you know, here in the area where I am. And I think like, can you look at an animal and just appreciate its beauty and where it lives? Like, why is there this desire to kill it? And so I guess that's just my in my head, you know, my, my hippie dream is that we would all just love, but it, no, just have compassion, just view, view animals through a lens of compassion would change the way we think about them just immediately and dramatically. What are you working on next? Yeah, I'm doing a, a few things right now, actually. So I am working on um, a chapter, there is another book coming out, and my chapter is going to be on livestock ethics which I didn't really think I would get into that, but finding that it's its own little kind of area that's often, so it's a book of agricultural ethics, actually. And then livestock ethics kind of falls under that, which I wasn't, you know, really familiar with. But from doing the work on this book and on this chapter, it's become much more interesting to me to see that this is an actual field of livestock ethics. So I'm working on that. Also, Mark Wilcox, right, who, so he's published some work on sort of animal liberty. And we share a lot of these interest in animal autonomy. And so we're actually working on thinking about or critiquing a sentience view of animal ethics and not that it's inherently wrong or bad, but that it doesn't really do a lot. So all these governments coming forward and saying, we've got the statement on animal ethics. I'm like, but you're still, it doesn't seem to do anything <laughs> That's to say you have a view of animals as sentient. So we're kind of trying to pull together this sort of critique of the sentience view and kind of bolster a view that looks more at animal agency, animal autonomy, animal liberty, those kinds of concepts instead to say that this is really what we should promote. So those kinds of things I'm, I'm working on. And then some other, I also used to do work in environmental ethics, so I'm trying to kind of connect some of that as well. And how can people find out more about your work? I do have the a page in the University of Guelph website. It does. I try to keep that relatively up to date. I am actually working on a website finally because I had one and it, I hated it. So I <laughs> deleted it. But now I'm working on one that will actually just, I've got the domain. It'll be drnatalithomas.com. So I am working on that and hope to release it in the next couple of months. But yeah, University of Guelph website, the philosophy department, you can find me there too. Well, thanks so much, Natalie, for joining us for this podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you, listeners, for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook, and you can just find us at Knowing Animals. You can also follow me on Twitter at Josh L. Milburn or on Instagram at A Vegan Philosopher. And please do tell others all about this podcast. And please do review the podcast where you found it. We're keen to reach new listeners. I'm Josh Milburn, and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.